Do you support any legal limits on how late a woman should be able to terminate a pregnancy? I support it Roe v. Wade. That means he can take the life of the baby in the ninth month and even after birth. That is simply not true. We are not for late-term abortion, period, with, with, with the COVID, excuse me, with um, dealing with everything we have to do with, uh, look, we had the safest border in history. Now we have the worst border in history. There's never been anything like it. There's no data to support what he said. Once again, he's exaggerating. He's lying. And I'm going to continue to move until we get the total ban on the, 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 the total initiative relative to what we're going to do with more border patrol and more uh, asylum officers. President Trump? Uh, I really don't know what he said at the end of that sentence. I don't think he knows what he said either. It's the 4th of July, but the latest news, the greatest buzz since last week has been the debate between Trump and Biden. What do you think about the debate? Well, I think I, I should first of all say, you know, happy 4th of July to every American watching this. And it's exactly a week ago that I saw the debate. Uh, coincidentally, I watched the debate while I was in transit driving uh, that was in Canada. And I'm lucky this time to be in Florida. It doesn't get any more American city than this. The debate for everyone who has seen this, including the liberal media, the left wing media, there is an acknowledgement of the fact that it was a woeful outing for Biden and maybe for Democrats altogether. Key Democrats, including Barack Obama, including the, the Speaker of, of the House, that's Hakeem Jeffries, and key representatives like um, Richie Torres from New York. Each one of them have admitted the fact that that was a woeful outing for Biden. In fact, Biden himself acknowledges the fact that that was a really bad outing for himself. To my surprise, right after I saw the debate, the liberal media, CNN inclusive, right after began to talk about the fact that the Democratic Party needs to find a substitute for Joe Biden. And to a greater surprise, even watching from the Canadian side, which the liberal there is heavily liberal, the national specifically, uh, interviewing uh, the CNN anchor, that's uh, Brian Stelter, he right off the bat, right off the debate, talked about the fact that this is not a good candidate for the Democratic Party. Curious, what was it like to watch that? Brian and then Paul. It was painful. I think it was painful for Democrats across the United States who wanted to see Biden stronger and sharper. It was also painful for some Republicans who would rather see Donald Trump uh, drift off into the distance and rather see Nikki Haley take over the party. But the reality is that Trump has control over the GOP in a way that Biden does not have control over the Democrats. Uh, most Republicans ended this debate feeling better about their candidate. Most Democrats came away feeling worse. Nikki Haley, who I just mentioned, is on Twitter tonight predicting that Biden will not be the Democrat on the ticket by the fall. And right now there are active conversations in Democratic Party circles about whether it's possible to replace Biden. It would be hard to do, but it is not impossible. The convention is still weeks away. And honestly, uh, the levels of concern, the levels of panic in the Democratic Party are off the charts tonight. So. Whichever way you look at it, if the Democrats, the extreme left-wing media and everyone that represents that spectrum of um, the American politics, admit the fact that that was a very woeful outing for Biden, there's no way to excuse it. It was indeed a very woeful outing. And I think it should concern anyone. I think with the exception in this case, who has, who has been the least concerned is Jill Biden, shamefully, Biden's wife, who I watched the way she pulled him off the stage, but she's, she's the least concerned about that, um, that debate. And I think yesterday also I saw that 66% of the Democratic base still thinks that Biden should still be on the ballot for the upcoming elections. So. We see how that plays out, but I can't excuse the fact that that was a woeful debate. So the second thing 
uh, with respect to my opinion about the debate was first of all I did not like the debate I didn't like the fact that these two people Biden and Trump took a lot of time looking into the past and then actually looking into the future to talk about the policies that will shape the nation and that will even shape the, the global landscape in the years to come or in the next four years of their administration if they're elected. They look too much into the past. Tr Trump talking about Russia, Russia collusion, the indictment, which is important because he's indicted. Um, and he talked a lot more about, you know, the impeachment and whatnot. These are things we've heard Trump talk about a billion times. And Biden also kind of bragging about a job recovery post COVID and COVID vaccine ad ad administration and those kind of things. Those those are events in the past. What I would have loved to see is a more futuristic policies from these two guys. The second thing, which is funny is the fact that it's clear to me that these two guys actually genuinely dislike each other. I don't want to say that they hate each other. I think they can determine that. But it's clear that they dislike each other. This is not just your typical debate and, you know, kind of um, Trump and DeSantis and coming after each other, Trump calling him DeSantimonious. This is not like Trump and Nikki Haley. This is not like Obama Hillary, even in the first or second administration, where both of them were debating and, you know, taking a jab at each other. This is not like Bernie Sanders and uh, Elizabeth Warren coming after each other, even though they claim they're friends. In this case, I think if Trump meets Biden on the street, it will likely not give him a wave of the hand because they actually dislike each other. I think they, they not only dislike each other's policies, I don't think they like each other. So that was clear to me from this debate as well. I'm hoping that with respect to being futuristic about their policies, maybe there will be another debate where they will make that clear to the world, hopefully, and yeah, I can only hope for that. Okay, so another major concern and the reason why the Democratic Party even wants to remove Biden from the ballot, his mental acuity during the debate. What did you think about that whole showdown? Well, like I said, I watched this, I watched this debate while I was in transit. And what caught my attention right away was Biden's voice, his raspy voice. And it, it sounded to me like a truly old man that he is. The second thing was the confusion that was going on in his mind. You know, he took a break um, and several points while having, um, while responding to questions. In fact, his facial expression looked very confused. And, you know, taking long pauses. This is not like you're taking long pauses trying to find the right words to fill in your sentence. This is like, I lost my train of thought completely. In fact, I forgot about what I was talking about when I started the sentence. That is clear to any right thinking person. And that was my opinion about it. It sounds to me like a genuinely old man who is losing touch with the realities around him. And I compare him with someone like my grandmother, who is like 95 right now. I mean, she still has it put together, but you can tell this is an old woman at this point, you know, compared to the woman that I knew when I was a kid who did businesses and, you know, um, was always in the market. This woman now needs to be helped off, you know, getting off the steps in, in her own house. She's not doing any businesses anymore. Sometimes she may forget your name. She might confuse me with my brother. And that is what Joe Biden looked to me at that debate. A genuinely, genuinely old man. So I think the concerns about the state of his mind and his health are genuine. So overall, the debate was considered woeful, but did either candidate do anything well at all? Well, since I'm talking about Biden, let me just uh, talk about him next. If I'm to find one thing that Biden did well in that debate, of course, I have to search really hard. But I try to not be too biased against him. The first thing 
is that I felt Biden's mind woke up momentarily when he was talking about his social policies. Also, when he was talking about his environmental policies, he woke up momentarily. And is there another time that I can say Biden woke up? He woke up when he was talking about restoring Roe v. Wade if he's reelected. I think that might actually be a lie because I don't see how that is going to work out. He would need someone from the Supreme Court to to retire before he can bring in another liberal um, judge into the Supreme Court. And when he talked about um, other social policies, I think he kind of woke up here and there. His environmental policy also where he mentioned the fact that climate change to him is the most existential crisis globally. His mind woke up there as well. Of course, Trump took a jab at him you know, at that, also talking about um, his environmental policies. Of course, Democrats also said that uh, Trump lied about um, oh, having clean air and clean water during his administration. But yes, Biden articulated his environmental policies well. Now to Trump, my first opinion about Trump is the fact that actually he's a very funny guy. I saw when he took a jab at Biden, you know, talking about, oh, I doubt he knows what he just said there because I also don't know what he just said finishing that sentence, which is true. Biden said gibberish finishing that sentence that Trump was, Trump was referencing there. I think the other thing with Trump was the fact that this is probably the first time I saw Trump debate really well, not interjecting his opponent, maybe because they turned off the mic, but I think it did a good job that he didn't have to tell him, oh, it's Biden's turn. He did that well. But I wish Trump communicate, communicated more than the same old, same old Russia, Russia uh, indictment, impeachment. Um, I wish he did that. But they said he lied about several things. I am waiting for the fact check to come out and we see how that goes. Okay, so here you are. You live in Canada. Okay, occasionally you might visit the States. But... This is a U.S. debate. Why do you care, someone living in Canada? Why, why do you care at all? I think for any Canadian who is understanding about trade, who is understanding about geopolitics, and as well defense, they will actually care about American elections. If you're understanding about trade, you will know that the United States is actually the largest trade partner to Canada. The Canadian dollars heavily rely on USD. In fact, when the Bank of Canada sets the over, overnight um, rates, it's most times, in fact, look historically, all the way to the 60s, you will find that the overnight rate in Canada tracks the federal rate. And, you know, consequentially, Inflation rate also tracks with the U.S. from Canada. In fact, many times I think um, there is no escaping um, for, the, for the Bank of Canada in the sense that they have to track with the U.S. 75% 70, of our trade is tied to the United States. And I think that's very, very important. The recovery also, the economic recovery since COVID, if you look at it, it has tracked Mostly with the United States, I, th I think there is a point of divergence, and that's because productivity has been lower in Canada. So, economically, I think every Canadian should care about the United States politics. Maybe that's why I care. In terms of defense, we are all part of NATO. So, decisions affect each other. Take, for instance, the two wars going on around the world in Europe and the Middle East. Canada has also you know, put a lot of money into that war. If we were able, you know, globally, or I should say within North America, if we were able to have mitigated that war, then maybe our money would have been divested into something else than, you know, sponsoring the wars going on out there in Europe right now in, in the Middle East. So, for that reason, I also care about the policies coming out of the politics in the United States. 
And of course, you can talk about uh, geopolitics and foreign policies, how that affects each other, you know, Canada and the United States. I think that is very, very important. And in fact, I think this is not just a thing that should be peculiar to me, you know, being Canadian. Of course, I come to the States every now and then, but every Canadian should actually at this point begin to lend their voices to, to the politics going on in the U.S. and, you know, holistically be able to appraise the candidates right from the primaries all the way to the general elections and be able to say this one makes things better than the other because eventually the policies would affect your livelihood as Canadian over time depending on whoever is in power or in, the, in this case, in, in fact, whichever political pa party is in power. Okay, and to wrap this up, so you've, you've given us reason as Canadians to care about this U.S. debate, care about U.S. politics and what happens uh, with policies that are made in the States. But on a global level, why should people around the world look to what is happening in the States politically? Yeah, I know that's a very, that's a tough question for you to be able to bring people globally, you know, the average Jane Doe, the average Carl Smith or John Smith from the ends of the earth to bring their mind to the point that they care enough about American politics. That's a hard one, but think about it like this. You know, with reference to Canada, I talked about our economy being tied to the state. Global economy is tied to the USD. In fact, most trades are done with the USD dominating the trade. From the ends of the earth, far away Africa, go to as far as Asia and Europe, USD dominates. And because of that, if the economy of your nation, in fact, is tied to the USD, that means your currency relative to the USD should concern you. And because of that, the trade agreements, the way trades are carried out, you should care about that locally within your nation. And that has a direct impact on who is in power in the United States. So economically, that's very important. Geopolitics, that is also very important in that how did we get into two disastrous wars? And you might say, oh, it's just going on in Europe and the other one is just going on in the Middle East, but, the, but that's not correct. You know, COVID, first of all, dealt a blow on the global economy and that's why there was recession in many places they, they might not call it recession but there was a high inflation astronomical inflation in many countries around the world COVID did that already many nations especially the developing nations have hardly recovered from the impact of COVID and to now worsen it almost like the nail on the coffin is that you know um, global supply chain broken down by COVID is now made worse by the wars going on in Europe and in the Middle East. The supply of grain, for instance, to several countries in Africa. And that has had a significant impact on their economy. So when you talk about defense, that is also very important. Now, there is all this talk about, you know, BRICS and, you know, Russia and China and many African countries coming together. And that's because there is some kind of weakness that is already seen through the American politics. And if, if you look at it, for instance, the exit from Afghanistan, how does that affect you as a people, you know, from whichever ends of the earth you come from. The exit from Afghanistan, you know, the Taliban's take over. How do we fight ISIS? You should care about that. And directly that is tied in, into who is in power in the U.S. Who will fight terrorism globally? We need to think about that. And people should think about that. So economically, geopolitics, those are key issues to think about. And the last part which is controversial, and I find it very important also, is social policies. Of course, there are many other things I can talk about, but because of the brevity of time, I'll just limit it to the social policies also coming out of the state. Almost any social policy 
that comes out of the states quickly becomes a global social policy. You know, since the last administration, and in fact, actually not just the last administration, since Obama's administration, you find that there is a lot of hold, a strong hold, for instance, that is put on the neck of African nations. And I speak about African nations because I am actually Nigerian by origin. Social policies are being traded for aids that the nations are receiving. And that's why Obama would visit Kenya and would talk about LGBTQ rights. And Kamala Harris will visit Ghana and talk about the same. And it's coming at the cost of, oh, you either support all the social policies that we've developed in the United States, or you forfeit your aid. June 2015, when the United States legalized same-sex marriage, mind you, there are several other Western nations and other nations across uh, many parts of the world, you know, Denmark, Norway, uh, the United Kingdom, Canada, all these countries have actually legalized the same even before the United States. But the issue with, you know, same-sex marriage, which is opposing to many cultures across the world, never became a global issue until it was legalized in the state. So, if you're thinking right from any part of the world, policies coming from the United States, United States are consequential directly on your life, directly on your economy, directly on your defense as a people, and you should care about it. I think at this point, actually, Anyone from the ends of the earth should actually be saying the right things on social media. Tweet about it. Raise your voice about it. Raise concerns about it. Concerns about Biden's health, which many liberal um, propagandas and agendas are hiding right now. Raise your voice about it. Say your thoughts. I think, you know, it's often said that, you know, this election is the most significant election in the United States history. You know, I've never actually agreed with that until now, but I think... This is probably the most significant election in our lifetime, at least as far as I know. Well, there we have it. Fola brought to you his thoughts about the latest U.S. debate between Trump and Biden and why you should care about what's happening in the U.S., about U.S. politics and how that impacts you and your daily life. Well, thanks for joining. Well, if you like the video you just saw, I totally recommend that you subscribe to the channel. That will be very helpful to me to bring more inspiring thoughts that can, you know, stir up critical thinking in the minds of many people across the world. So please click on the subscribe button right now and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.